Good evening. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of a Public Affairs Program. And on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. The subject of this evening's discussion is diplomacy. Now, diplomacy covers a vast territory, and exploring its many aspects can be tricky. So for our purposes, the focus will be not on the traditional diplomacy, where qualities of negotiation and compromise have allowed diplomats to resolve intractable conflicts. Instead, the discussion will focus on that aspect of diplomacy that examines the use of threats and how threats represent a distinctive category within the broader field of just war ethics. In choosing to set a discussion on traditional diplomacy aside, we are left with a central question, which is, under what conditions can and should threats of force be used effectively to accomplish different types of foreign policy objectives? And are there ever justifiable reasons for issuing threats? Now for the curious and wondering about why this program and why this topic. While this program came about at the suggestion of our journal editors, Adam Reed Brown and John Krasansniak, who in the summer issue of our acclaimed International Journal of Ethics and International Affairs, published an article entitled Threats and Coercive Diplomacy, an Ethical Analysis. And by the way, we have complimentary copies which are available on the balcony during the reception. But knowing that the authors of this essay would be in New York City for the opening of the General Assembly, they thought, what a good idea to have them here to discuss their essay, and I agree. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome Professors Greg Reichenberg and Henrik Sisi from Norway. And in to reach this discussion, they have invited Ambassador Gosamri Kashru, permanent representative of Iran to the UN, who is joining them on the podium. I believe you all have a copy of their bios, which were handed out when you checked in, and I encourage you to read them if you haven't already. Now, the Carnegie Council, as many of you know, is a platform for discussion. As such, we look forward to hearing the views of our panelists with whom you may choose to agree or disagree. Each panelist will speak for about seven to 10 minutes, and then we open the discussion up so that you can ask any questions that haven't been addressed during their presentation. Now, I ask please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our guests today, our moderator, Henry, Ambassador Kashri, and Greg. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you so much for the invitation to come here. And thanks not least to the wonderful journal editors at Ethics and International Affairs. I really mean that. I'm a journal editor myself and spend much of my time moving commas, and they do it better than most. <laughs> I wonder, should it be ethics matter or ethics matters? But we can discuss that later. <laughs> now, uh, our topic today is uh, threats. I hope no one has felt threatened to come here. Uh, before I quickly introduce the topic. Uh, I would like to say that uh, we are very grateful to the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which actually helped fund the research that is at the background of this project. Um, we come from PRIO, the International Peace Research Institute also. We have been working on this for a few years, and I'd like to point out that President Trump and his administration is not the focus. Many of the problems we are discussing definitely predate Trump. But the relationship between the US and Iran today definitely illustrates the many vexing challenges of threats and coercive diplomacy. And hence, we are most grateful to Ambassador Hushru for setting aside the time during a very uh, busy week to be with us here tonight. This evening is not about taking sides or finding final solutions, but it is about listening to viewpoints. And I think, arguably, we need to do more of that. What we are discussing here tonight is indeed a deep-seated problem of international politics, yet it is also an everyday challenge from our regular lives, and I'd like to take that as my point of departure. This is what the philosopher John Rawls calls the domestic analogy, when we can compare this to things that we know from everyday life. For instance, your child does not want to go to bed. You tell her, if you do not go to bed now, I won't let you go to the Carnegie Council to hear Dr. Sreisberg and Cesar and Kutcher speak. <laughs> now, if that doesn't scare her, nothing will. Well, maybe something else then. Uh, mine used to be, and I have one of my daughters with me on this trip, which is wonderful. If you don't go to sleep now, we will not go on our summer hike. And of course, the kids soon looked through me and said, Dad, we know we're going on the summer hike anyway. You've already rented the cabin, <laughs> which renders the point moot. Now, what if, let me ask you this question. What if we threaten something that it would be immoral actually to do? 
What if you say, if you don't do this, I'll kill you? And what if the threat succeeds? In the sense that the other party does what we want him or her to do. Maybe it is even something that is truly good that comes about. Will the threat then be justified? These are the sorts of questions that we humbly broach in our article and which we find very much underexposed in the literature on the ethics of war and armed force. Now, the founders of the United Nations clearly worried about the threat to use armed force as a way of illegitimately getting one's way. And so famously, as most of you will know, the UN Charter does not, not only forbid the use of force, but also, and indeed equally, the threat of use of force. Our article aims to explore whether it is actually the case that threats are as unethical as the actual unethical acts, and also to explore whether there might be legitimate uses of threats of use of force. Our conclusion is uh, nuanced but largely affirmative of the thesis that threats of use of force are often problematic along with the acts one threatens, and maybe in more ways than we initially Think of. For instance, if you are to threaten something, you also have to prepare yourself to do it. If you are to threaten with nuclear weapons, you have to build them and maintain them. Does that also increase the danger that they will be used? But at the same time, we do not rule out that threats or threat like statements can sometimes be just and useful. Our article delineates how threats can be characterized as different sorts of speech acts. And I won't go into detail on that now. Greg will deal with a few more of those. But if we are to use some of this technical uh, language, technical terminology, we can say that the threat, properly speaking, combines what we call the directive and the commissive. That means we actually want to direct some sort of action or maybe avoid it. We want to tell someone, do this rather than that. And we also commit ourselves to doing something if this does not happen. That's the standard formula of a threat. If it is said unconditionally, we'll actually do it anyway, then the directive part of the threat is really pretty weak. You know, we'll catch you dead or alive, whether you want to or not. But if it is conditional, you may do something to avert this. Unless you do this, I will do this. Or unless you stop doing that, I will have to do this. Well, then you have a choice. As I said, Greg will go further into this. But what we're talking about then is conditional threats. And these require intentionality. The threatener intends to achieve something by this. And the way in which the other party acts in response will influence the way in which the threatener achieves it. The final point that I'll make before giving the floor to these other eminent gentlemen is that the sort of speech act that I've just described, where you threaten to perform some harmful act unless a person or group of persons does not or does something, is it necessarily immoral? Clearly not. Domestic law does this all the time, doesn't it? Unless you pay your taxes, we may compel you to pay either them or a fine or suffer a penalty. And we all think that's OK. But key to the legitimacy of such a threat is the legitimacy of the authority formulating the threat. And the, proportional, and the, and the threat must also be proportionate and predictable and credible. If the government, for instance, threatens automatic incarceration without trial, or they threaten loss of life for the late payment of taxes, we would clearly find ourselves outside of legitimate coercion. Likewise, if neighborhood posses, I like that term, the posse, <laughs> gather the posse, took on the job of enforcement, or if the demands were totally unpredictable and changed all the time, such that what was allowed one day was suddenly severely punished the next, we would say that the threats are illegitimate. And these are the kinds of things that we try to delineate, because we believe that these things do happen in international diplomacy all the time, not least the lack of proportionality and the lack of predictability and credibility. And by this, I give the floor to my excellent colleague, Greg Reichberg. Thanks very much, Henrik. Uh, Henrik made a distinction between unconditional and conditional threats. I'd like to start off by making a couple of other useful distinctions in this context. Uh, first of all, conditional threats differ from warnings. By the enunciation of a warning, a speaker simply tells the target what consequences are likely to follow from her action. A warning is a statement of fact. 
with a threat by contrast, a stated consequence, I will do X, is explicitly linked to another's compliance with some directive. Do Y or X will follow. In dancing, I'm a terrible dancer, so this will be relevant. In dancing, if I inform my partner that I will in all likelihood step on her foot if she fails to dance in time with the music. My wife is here. This has happened. <laughs> all right, that's a warning. By contrast, if I inform her that I will intentionally step on her foot unless she dances in time with the music, I am threatening her. That said, warnings are often thought to be more morally acceptable than threats. So it is not uncommon for, party, for, for parties to reformulate their threats as warnings. It makes them more, sound more acceptable. Conditional threats are of two kinds, deterrent and compellent. In both cases, I issue a directive to someone and a penalty is assigned for noncompliance. The directive can consist in an order not to do something. The point of the threat is to deter a certain line of action, to prevent it. These are deterrent threats. And of course, nuclear deterrent threats are, is a you know, particular category, a subcategory of the wider field of deterrent threat. In contrast, I can seek to compel someone into a particular line of action. As when Saddam Hussein and his sons were told by George Bush, Leave Iraq or else. It wasn't, they weren't trying to deter anything. They were trying to tell them, do this. Take these steps. These threats are compellent. With deterrent threats, the penalty is kept in reserve. It is posited in a conditional future should the target engage in forbidden action. And it is here that the language of red line comes into play. Cross this line and this penalty will be administered. However, if compellent threats are to be credible, usually some pain must be administered up front so that the target starts moving in the desired direction. And the target does not want to move in that direction. So you've got to do some pushing. The US sanctions that have lately been renewed against Iran have the character of compellent threats. The penalty, in this case a trade embargo, is intended as a message. Let us call this an action threat. The message is this. Unless you comply with our demands, renegotiate JCPOA, remove your troops from Syria, stop your support for Hezbollah, you know, you know that the list goes on, this pain will be continued and even intensified. All right, so this is a compelling threat. What ethical principles can we bring into play to assess threats? We have already noted that threats are not necessarily bad. Sometimes they can even be good. What principles can enable us to discern the difference? And in our article, we draw on the so-called criteria of the just war tradition to organize our thinking about the relevant ethical principles. I, I gave a presentation on this topic uh, two weeks ago, and it I spent at least three hours talking through the relevant ethical principles, and I can't do that tonight because my time is nearly up. So I just want to make, refer to two, two of these ethical criteria. Uh, the first is, where did it go? Proportionality. Just cause. Then I'll get, no, forget proportionality. Okay. Sorry. We don't have time for that. Okay, just, just cause. Just cause is paramount. Threats are not the default position in any civilized discourse. There is a presumption against threats. Their use must always be justified. I cannot here rehearse all of the possible reasons that might warrant resort to threats. Suffice it to say that a wrong must have been done or is in the process of being renewed. The penalty threatened must be commensurate with that wrong. If it should be apparent that an individual or a state has little or no intent, inclination for the wrongful behavior that the threat aims to stop, we would say that that person or state has been unjustifiably threatened. And someone who views himself with no propensity for committing the wrong in question 
will invariably feel that his honor has been impugned when he has thus been threatened. And I think this would describe Iran's position and reaction as it relates to nuclear weapons. We should not underestimate the importance that honor plays in the mind of statesmen. They view themselves as the custodians of their country's honor. All right, so that's just cause. And I just want to wrap up with a few words about right intention. If threats are to be rightly issued, they must be done with the right intention. This implies, among other things, that the penalty promised in the event of noncompliance Will be, will be withheld if the stated demand is met. It is easy to construe a situation in which the party issuing a threat wants to implement the sanction regardless of what the other does and is looking for any pretext to demonstrate noncompliance so it can do what it wanted to do all along. This is a patent violation of the condition of right intention. Secondly, behind every threat in due form, there is an assurance an assurance that the promised penalty will be suspended if the stated condition is met. The assurance is integral to the threat. This assurance must be credible, clearly stated, with benchmarks laid out so the adversary will know what is expected of him. Moving the benchmarks, or as we say, the goalposts. So with each act of compliance, a new demand is proffered. This is inconsistent with right intention. To conclude, I think it is important to inoculate ourselves against the mistaken assumption that in relations between adversaries, only threats will do. Only threats will have an impact. Only threats will modify behavior. But in making this assumption, we forget that the adversary need not always be an adversary. We forget that there is a very real process by which an adversary becomes a friend, or at least someone with whom I can cooperate. There is a saying, at least in, I learned it in school, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. That is false. <laughs> words can harm. And when their effect is to cast aspersion on the honor of another person, or even a nation, the wound will stick even for years, and enmity will deepen. I think it was Kant who said, do not do in war what will prevent the resumption of amity after war's end. The same holds true for threats. So even when threats may sometimes be necessary, so even when threats may sometimes be necessary, our use of them should be very sparing. And they should be framed in such a way that space is left open for future friendship. Thank you, Greg. Uh, very good. We'll um, move then to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Hushru. Very happy that you could set aside the time to give some comments on some of the things we've claimed here or whatever other part of this problem that you'd like to highlight in your seven to ten minutes. And then we'll open up the floor anyway, to the floor anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have prepared about seven to ten minutes, <laughs> and then I will I will I will read that piece, and then I would be more than happy to get involved in dialogue. The contemporary international law is based on the presumption of sovereign equality of states, which prohibits the threat or use of force, and opts for the path of multilateralism and peaceful settlement of dispute as a viable solution. The founders of the United Nations put the member states under a concrete legal obligation to resort to peaceful means to settle their international disputes and to refrain from the threat or use of force. These prescriptions and prohibitions are not only inserted in the UN Charter, but they have also been endorsed in other instruments such as Vienna Convention of Law of Treaties and 1970 Declaration on the Principles of International Law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states. Hence, resort to unilateral threats as a means of foreign policy has very little room in the current international relations. 
some might notably argue, as you did, that sanctions and threats would sometimes help re restore justice in international communities, such as for the plight of racism in South Africa in the past, and even assist in preventing wars and therefore shall not be rejected altogether. Even in those instances where such tools as threats and sanctions are applied to make accountable applied to make accountable countries that based on credible, substantiated and objective evidence breach international law and specifically peremptory norms, it would certainly bear unwarranted side effects for innocent civilians and the right of wider public. In any case, application of these methods where the object is fully complying with the international law can in no way be justified. In the case of Iran and the case of JCPOA, I will later uh, elaborate on that. Uh, this administration is punishing Iran not because of violating of the resolution and the content of the JCPOA that was supported and endorsed by a Security Council resolution, but because it is abided by that. Because 12 report of the IAEA has clearly indicated, confirmed that Iran has been fulfilling its obligation under this deal. Then the US is punishing Iran. Not only Iran is punishing Norway, France, China, all countries in the world, if they are abided by this resolution of the Security Council. This is a new phenomenon. And this is laughable, and I will dis describe why. Ultimatum, imposing sanctions and making threats against other states has been a consistent tool and an essential element in US foreign policy. Most United States administration and political figures in one way or another have illegally and immorally threatened others in order to proceed with their short-sighted national policies or even aspirations of their relevant political parties. The well-known phrase of all options on the table comes against this background. However, the new administration seems to be utterly reliant and confident about using threats in different forms and manifestation and coercion in international relations and put that put the whole notion of multilateralism at the stake. This administration has gone so extreme that recently intimidated the International Criminal Court with unilateral sanctions and threatened to prosecute the court's internationally elected judges and prosecutors in American courts. United States seems to believe that sanctions, bullying, and threats represent magical solution to every challenge that they face in their relations with other states, be it Turkey, China, Mexico, Russia, Cuba, or Venezuela. Trump's speech in the previous UN, UN General Assembly last year is a good example of illegal and immoral threats against other states. By threatening North Korea to total destruction in the General Assembly, Assembly Hall, Trump crossed all the ethical and legal boundaries. His statement also contains several weird and odd threats against the Islamic Republic of Iran. He threatens to withdraw from the nuclear deal endorsed by the Security Council and despite strong appeals from the international community, including their closest allies, which actually did it a few months later. This administration later declared its intention to impose the strongest sanction regime in the history that included extraterritorial sanctions against third countries and foreign parties. It means that the US, by weaponizing its economy and currency, is threatening international community not to, to make business with Iran. This policy not only interferes with the internal affairs of other countries, but also violate Security Council Resolution 2231, which calls for promoting and facilitating the development of normal economic and trade contacts and cooperation with Iran. 
It is ironic that for the first time in the history of the United Nations, the United States is engaging in penalizing nations across the entire world, not for violating a Security Council resolution, rather for abiding by it. This is something very, very new and very special. And then, based on this resolution, countries are encouraged to normalize their relationship, their economic relationship with Iran. And Iran is abided by the content of this resolution. And the US unilaterally withdraw from it and imposing sanction. Yes, we didn't have relationship, economic relationship with America. There was a good deal between Iran and Boeing and we were supposed to buy for 15 years about 300 aircraft that would uh, create about 100,000 jobs for American, but they decided not to do that. And, but the, the rest of our economic relationship with is not with America, with the rest of the world. And this administration is threatening others, not because Iran is not abiding the international law, but because it is fulfilling its commitment. This, this, is, this is something that we should consider. This is, this is really, really a new phenomenon. And I wanted you to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What we will do now in the remaining 23 minutes that we have until 7 o'clock is to open this up to the floor for questions. This is not like a radio or TV program where we have absolutely every view represented. I guess to most of you, the US position will be quite well known that Ambassador Hushru is here uh, responding to. Uh, but of course, the interesting thing is that the arguments that he uh, lays out are directly related to the topic of our article, namely, how do we enact this sort of diplomacy where we have these deep disagreements and where we wish somehow, in spite of the equality of all nations and the respect we should show each other, nonetheless, to influence the policy of another nation. How do we do that. So uh, uh, I see, do I see any hands? Yes, we see a hand there already and one more down so there. Just one, um, we have microphones set up on either side and I would invite um, the guests here to come to the microphone and ask their questions. Very good. I'll sort of direct traffic, but I thank you all for You can direct the traffic, that's, okay. that's beautiful. And we remind you because of the time, please short and pointed right. questions rather than uh, lengthy statements. Oh, no, I invite you to go to either side of the microphones, which we have set up, and we'll alternate between sides. Line up with the microphone. Yes. Angela, please introduce yourself. Hello, shall I start? Hi, I'm Angela Kane. I'm a longtime former UN uh, staff member, and uh, I'm now living in Vienna and am the uh, senior fellow at an NGO. My question is, I found your analysis very compelling about the nature of the threats and how they are presented and but I think that what we have now and as the ambassador has very rightly said we have an unprecedented situation and the question is you should have another paper really written about what are the toolbox what is in the toolbox what tools can be uh, applied in order to remedy the situation because we are now totally helpless in terms of it's not only Iran but it's also uh, other countries European countries in terms of the sanctions and the threats that have been made by the United States so what can actually be done and I'm thinking that within the United Nations you've had other uh, instruments that were created like for example peacekeeping now I mean that's a very big topic but on the other hand what else can be done within the organization to think about how to counter this mm -hmm. thank you very good question. Should we take one or two more before we comment, or? Um, maybe one at a time, one off. Okay. okay. Each one of you want to com mm. comment, or just, you can mm. direct your question to an individual I'll, or I'll whoever chooses to say that, that That's a great question. I, I think there's a systemic problem in political philosophy, act, political, political science, because if you study the foremost theoricians of, of threats, like Thomas Schelling, it, they say that there's something above threats. There's another way, of, another kind of interaction. But they don't, they, don't, 
they never spell that out. So you get this impression that the whole field of international affairs, particularly where there's some adversarial relationships going on, is dealt with through threats of different kinds. So I think we need to put more effort into thinking about these other modes of interaction and become more skillful in those. Uh, so that's, I, yeah, I agree. And of course, this also touches on the question of international jurisdictions, which right now is very hard when you have uh, one of the leading nations of the world saying that we do not want to be part of these sorts of institutions if they can punish us. So there must be, and of course, what I'm referring to now is the International Criminal Court. But if we're thinking what kind of organization you could have to uh, somehow negotiate in these sorts of situations, it's hard to see what that would be right now. And you are right. It's an unprecedented situation in many ways. It's, very, it's a very special week right now, isn't it, in so many ways? Yeah. So we'll leave some of that. We won't talk about the Supreme Court now, so we'll leave that anyway. Ambassador Carson. Yes, please. Yeah. The whole notion of international law is that if one is powerful, is not, it is not legitimate to violate others' right and those who are weaker or not that much strong. Mm. But now this administration is saying that I'm mightful, then I'm right, and I'm threatening all, and it doesn't matter how and why. I will do that. This is this is new phenomenon. Even even they are threatening us, and they are telling us that if you don't give me a photo opportunity with your president, we will be sanctioned you like that. This, this is this is ridiculous. This is not acceptable. And international law is for respecting others, based on equality and justice and fairness, and then mutual interaction. Otherwise, otherwise, we are not living in a human society. We are getting back to those areas that the one that was more powerful was, uh, you know, by arresting, by killing, by attacking. This is, this is, this is not good. <coughs> Uh, hello. Thank you, Ambassador Koshru, for taking the time to come here today. Um, I have a question about the new dynamic that you talked about and where abiding by an agreement can actually lead to punishment and, and how perhaps that seems to go beyond the concept of right intention um, that, uh, that we learned about earlier. What is the reason for this, this, this upheaval or this shift? And does the increased messianic and fundamentalist tone of certain actors on the political right have anything to do with this change? Uh, we, we don't know, but, uh, but here in America, this administration is against whatever the previous one has done. <laughs> and if it is, it doesn't matter if it has been good or bad. For example, this nuclear deal is, he considered this as uh, the, you know, as something that was, uh, Obama was doing that, or Kerry was doing that, then it should be rejected. Um, this, this reflects some kind of ideological approach towards something that previous administration has done. And yes, there are, there are some, uh, you know, the, we, we really don't know what is happening in, in U.S. Is it, is it a new, new trade agreement, new way of merchandising, some political relations? You know, we, we, we do not understand whether it is bullying or whether they, are, they, they only wanted to have. They are telling us that, come and I will give you a better, better chance, better achievement. Even yesterday, yesterday, President Trump tweeted that uh, I have no plan to meet the president of Iran, but absolutely, I'm sure he is absolutely a lovely man, you know. 
we were we were surprised. I I gave this to president, and he was laughing. He was saying, "What does it mean? Is absolutely? I'm sure he's absolutely lovely man. You know, this this was in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning. He he wrote this, and we are we are facing a situation that nobody can understand. There are and then." Out inside the White House, there are different voices. Outside the White House, there are different voices. And some are talking about the regime change. Some are talking regarding Iran. Some are talking about change of behavior. Some are talking about engaging in a grand bargaining matters. And also, yesterday, uh, yes, it was yesterday, there was a meeting on, of Security Council that President Trump said that this meeting is only on Iran. So it was not on Iran, but he said that I will speak, it was on Iran. He repeated the same accusation that he did on Tuesday in the General Assembly. And it seemed that he owed one thanks to Iran. And he said that I am thankful to Iran and Russia and Syria because of their position toward Etlab in Syria. We were surprised that this Security Council meeting was only convened to thank Iran and Russia and Syria. We are, we are perplexed. We don't know really. Who should explain to us? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ali Mazzara with the State University of New York, and I direct a program for promoting and empowering young women to become global leaders. And one of my young colleagues is here who just graduated from the program. I thought the presentation was excellent in laying out the different perspectives and aspects of the threats and other areas. And one of the things that really stuck with me was the whole idea of respect and the honor that in order to negotiate and have maybe the other side is that hopefully in the future, be it Iran or other people or other countries, we would have um, that relationship. So Ambassador, if I go back to the program that I work with or other colleagues, <coughs> Americans, what would you want me to take in saying from an Iranian perspective, and I know this is a very broad question, that we would, you would want us to know in order to be able to respect and understand what is coming from the Iranian um, government? I'm sure you will not answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. If you want, I can okay. try. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, the history between Iran and America is not a good one. It started 65 years ago, almost a year before I was born. And then it was the coup d'etat in Iran by US and UK. And then the aftermath of it. I, I don't want to go to that. But in this background, President Obama, it started to open channel with Iran. And he sent different letters to Iran. Those letters to the president, to the leader, delineated a, a framework that we respect Iranian culture, Iranian history. We wanted to deal with you on mutual respect and equal sovereignty. We have some concern about your program, nuclear program. We wanted to negotiate with you, and we are ready to recognize your legal rights concerning enrichment if you are open and transparent. And then this kind of talk, uh, first, we didn't trust America. Later, some of our friends came to us and described that they are union on that. They, they wanted to do this. And then we started negotiating with them. But President Trump is threatening us and saying you should come to the table and we should do that. We should, this, this threat is not, we are not, he are threatening us to become friend. You know, how, how, how through, through threat we can become friend. What kind of friend is this? And he is. We were we were negotiated with American. 
through this JCPOA mechanism, at the level of foreign ministers, each year several times, our foreign ministers and US foreign ministers were negotiating with each other, and at the level of our deputy foreign ministers, and I was also involved here with American PR in the United Nations. We were exchanging views on different issues. There, there were several misunderstandings, several differences, but we were engaging in a respectful manner. And at the end of the day, we were able to reach an agreement. And then, yes, if, if US, US should differentiate between destructive power and constructive power. US has the most destructive power in the world. We can, we can annihilate the whole world in, in less than a second. Yeah. But US is unable to rule a village in Iraq, a village in Syria, a village in Yemen, in Afghanistan. Yeah. Because they, it lacks that kind of authority. We do have this in the region. This is why they are so unhappy about Iran. Anyhow, through constructive engagement, this President Rouhani, his first motto was in his election was constructive engagement with the world. With the world we meant with America. And we were able to do that. And they have different discussion. Our friends here know that. And the, through, based on that constructive dis discussion, this constructive engagement, we were able to reach a conclusion that was JCPOA, and it was very good for, for everybody, for everybody. It was a win-win solution for a very difficult oh, I problem. Constructive engagement is the takeaway is what you should mm. bring back to mm. your students. Mm. Moving on. Hi, sir. I'm, I'm Raj Ghosh from the British Mission to the UN. Uh, my question, can I just shift the, um, your principles to uh, apply your toolbox to Europe? Um, I think one of the biggest threats we face in Europe, um, with all due respect at the moment, uh, to the rules-based international system and, and international law is Russia's actions or from our perspective. So uh, the panel's advice on how most reasonable European countries should try and engage Russia um, would be. If I may be very brief in trying to answer that, I would echo what uh, Greg talked about when it comes to, well, I, I touched on it too, when it comes to predictability and the credibility that follows from that. Because if you get all kinds of different signals being sent and they're very unclear, sometimes that can be, of course, part of diplomacy, good cop, bad cop. But when it's unpredictable, so that you do not really know what is it that you are demanding. Uh, Greg used the uh, old sports term of moving the goalposts, which makes it very hard because then you set a demand and then seemingly a demand is met, or if it's not met, uh, you follow up, but then suddenly a new demand is made. And I think that's part of the problem in dealing with Russia today, is that there is a certain lack of predictability and thereby credibility, which of course goes both ways. It's really, really a difficult situation, which goes back to way before Trump. I mean, it goes back to uh, Georgia, it goes back to the Ukraine. Um, and then the final thing I would like to say, which is directly echoing what we just talked about, is this question of respect. And I guess somehow that is what the president is trying to convey in meeting with Putin. Many of us would say he's not doing it in the right way. Uh, but of course, this sense, when you talk about Russia, it's a lot like with Iran. It's a long history. These are deep historical roots and ties. And if you don't want to engage with them or just dismiss them or talk disrespectfully about them, that, that is also clearly a problem. Uh, that would be at least my, my careful take based on our article. John? Hey, I'm John Krasaniak. I'm a associate editor of Ethics and International Affairs, so I just work right upstairs. Um, my question gets at the distinction between law and morality. 
um, because all of you pointed to a tension that exists um, between what international law says, which is that there's a pretty clear, unequivocal blanket ban on threats of use of force and use of force. But on the other hand, in your article and in your comments, you indicated that maybe in some, even however narrow situations, um, threats might be justified. So my question is basically, does the UN Charter have it wrong? Or what is the value in a blanket ban in international law, even, with, even when our ethical intuitions tell us that they might sometimes be justified? What's the, how do we explain the sort of mismatch? Should I? I can make a yeah. Uh, just just to first step, he's I mean, much smarter than I, I mean, am. So well, I'll it's not. It's not that. But it's just, just the, while I still have some clarity, I'll, yeah. I'll, the um, you know the UN Charter, the state the statement on on the ban on on use of force and threats relates to using force and threats to settle disputes as a dispute settlement strategy. Uh, there is no ban in the UN Charter on using force and purpose for purposes of defense, right? So presumably, one can also use threats for purposes of defense. So uh, the, uh, and of course, the Security Council is also authorized to use force. So presumably, the Security Council is also authorized to, to, to use threats. So I just want to point out that the international law is not quite as narrow as, as I, you presented it to be. Uh, but I, I do want to emphasize, I thought Ambassador Hushu made a really important point that in the past, when the U.S. did use armed force, it would always try to show that, for instance, the invasion of Iraq, uh, which lacked a Security Council mandate. But still, even there, the U.S. tried to show that there was some basis in Security Council resolutions, that this armed action was, was supported, maybe not technically you know, in the narrow sense, but had some support in, in international law. Uh, but now it's just the opposite. It's true. It's, countries are penalized for supporting international law. And that, that's a very dangerous drift. But so uh, uh, there are a lot more could be saying, said in response, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, may I add yeah. also one sentence? Uh, yes, we are here focusing on international law. And International law is also a kind of compromise among powerful nations or among nations. And if we wanted to talk about morality, that is the higher standard, if law, international law is here, morality is there, then sometimes some of these uh, rules of and uh, regulation of international law would be immoral. For example, threat of force and sanction may, for example, prevent those sick people to get medicine and dying because of that, even, even if that sanction is legitimized by international law, morally it's incorrect. And if we wanted to, to judge by the uh, moral standards, many, many of the actions are not compatible with morality. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I can, uh, we, we take more questions. Okay. okay. Uh, Otherwise, uh, there would now come a long speech on the responsibility to protect and the relationship between <laughs> morality. But that's, that's for next time. Okay. Yeah, right. hey, my name is Leonard Stahl, and I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of a magazine called Philanthropy Age. Um, I'd like to take the US and Iran out of this question. Um, but. Uh, and it's, it's something for you to comment on, if you would. But, but surely, um, you know, you, I think it was Henrik who, who used the, the threat of putting his daughter to bed. Um, uh, you, you have the moral authority to do that. It, surely no one nation state should assume a moral authority to threat or, or coerce another. And until there is an equality of sovereignty, uh, of sovereignty um, then the toolbox cannot work. We do discuss that in our article because it's not just a legal question of the equality of nations. It's also a question of having what we often call the moral high ground. And of course, in some cases in international politics, there are states that act in such a way that what we often call the international community, that's a complex 
concept in itself, says we have to react somehow. And when we read history, we sometimes say one should have reacted earlier, the Rwanda problem. There should have been something done. Uh, sometimes that will be because sovereignty has, has broken down. But you're quite right. And that makes the whole question of legitimacy of authority one of the really difficult questions here. Because why can this nation say this? No, that's very true, very true. Mm. I think we'll take a last question mm. here. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Good evening, Mark Duncan. Uh, thank you very much for a panel of a very um, interesting thesis. Uh, you spoke very briefly about um, the legitimation criteria for coercive diplomacy, uh, namely that it should be um, predictable, proportionate, and also credible. Mm. It's another problem there that um, it's kind of impossible to make an objective assessment, really, of whether that criteria is ever fulfilled if we use the Iran example, just because we've talked about it a lot, then from the US perspective, they might say that their response was predictable because they would repeatedly indicated that this was a response that they were considering, yeah. and it was proportionate in regards to the issues that they had chosen to link the JCPOA with, you know, in terms of yeah. the greater Middle East and security issues. Whereas other outsiders, and of course, you know, uh, the other party themselves might consider it to be both unpredictable and disproportionate. If I, if I can say just very briefly, and I'll leave it to the two others to uh, deepen the answer. But firstly, I would say if one looks at, and this is a great question, the last few weeks of American diplomacy on this issue, uh, many things that the Secretary of State has said, uh, I, I would say that it is quite unclear. There are different sort of demands. It's not easy to sit on the other side and try to figure out, well, what is it they want us to do? But I agree, that could be read differently. But when you mention proportionality, as some of you will know, in what we call the just war thinking, it's not just what we talk about the ad bellum question. Is it right in the first place to do this, to go to war to threaten? It's also the question of the actual effects, which in war is called in bellum. And I think personally, one of the big questions now is the effects of sanctions. And I'm not now commenting on Iranian policy per se, but the effects of sanctions on the Iranian population today whether that is a proportionate sort of damage to what you are trying to achieve. And then you're back to discussions in war. You know, if you actually bomb a city, but by doing that you can force them back, well, clearly international law says no, because it's a direct attack on civilians. And one could construe some of the worst effects of the sanctions that are about now to come into effect to be of that kind. At least that could be argued. And that would be a violation of proportionality. But please. I mean, just on the link, the, the, the Trump's, Trump administration's claim that uh, JCPOA was flawed because it was, had, was not linked to a wider range of issues that it thinks, is a very, uh, thinks are important, uh, it seems to neglect the fact that when JCPOA was negotiated, the negotiators discussed this wider range of issues and could not reach a resolution on them. And they, they deliberately decided to set them aside. Right? And they reached an agreement on a, on a narrow range of issues. Uh, and to open that up and claim that the agreement was illegitimate for that reason, to me, makes no good sense. Uh, it, as though it had not, not as, the, as though the problem had not been entertained. Uh, I heard uh, Foreign Minister um, Zarif say that uh, Iran was deeply unhappy with the JCPOA, and he acknowledged that the U.S. too was deeply unhappy with the JCPOA. And he said, "To me, this shows why it's such a good agreement." <laughs> All right, because it's 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 a true compromise. Right? Neither party got all of what it wanted. Uh, and, I, you know, and, and for the Trump administration to come back and see, we want the whole hog. We, we, we didn't get all that we wanted. Therefore, it's a bad agreement. It's just that agreements are not made that way. Uh, concerning the Middle East, I haven't seen anybody any scholar or diplomat that can explain to me what is American policy in the Middle East, what, what American want, America want. 
they have destroyed Iraq. They have supported those opposition in Syria. They are supporting uh, Saudi Arabia in Yemen, fighting against what, what, what America wants. One could also ask, what does Iran want? Okay, I will, I will explain. <laughs> I will explain. Iran, well, Iran, Iran is, Iran is an immediate neighbor of these countries. And when America was supporting Saddam Hussein, and Saddam Hussein attacked Iran, and it was, and also all Arab countries, most of them were supporting Saddam. We didn't uh, surrender. We fought that war for eight years. And later, Saddam became the bad man and then followed what America did. We were, we were in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, Taliban were there. We were against Taliban and we were supporting the very tiny group that later America helped them to come to Kabul. America, Saudi Arabia, and others have made repeated mistakes in the region. And because of their mistakes, they have helped us to become powerful in the region. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't topple Saddam Hussein, America did. We didn't topple Taliban, America did. And all this, this, this is why I'm saying that I, I don't, we don't understand what, what America is looking for. And in Syria also, after all these six years of war, who is now, why, why Trump should come to the Security Council and thanks Iran? Because, because American foreign policy was so wrong there. And, and Arab countries were supporting terrorists and now Syria, Russia, Iran, and Turkey are somehow moving toward the constitutional arrangement for Syria based on the political will of the people. Then Iran is not, is not supporting uh, terrorists in the region. Iran is not destabilizing countries. Iran is in help of Iran helped Iraq to fight against Daesh. Iran helped Syria to fight against Daesh, and Iran was helpful to get rid of Taliban in, in Al Qaeda in, in, in Afghanistan. Iran wants a peaceful, stable, secure, prosperous region. Everybody share that, and this, this is what Iran wants to do. I would like to just reiterate once again that this is a platform for discussion, and you may agree or disagree with the views that are presented. But it does present a conversation to continue. So I invite you all to have a drink and continue the conversation. And I thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know I cannot. Thank you. Yeah. I know